So thank you everybody for coming. Tonight's webinar is titled Learning from Classic Film, Leadership Lessons from Frank Savage and the 918th. This webinar is part three of the five essential skills to be an effective webinar series. The goal of this series is to showcase five topics we think are important in becoming an effective executive. We think they are so important that each of these topics are included in both the MBA and, M and executive MBA curricula. We hope that you enjoy class this evening and attend all of our other um, events in the series. Our presenters this evening are Dr. Ray Grubbs, Professor Emeritus at Millsaps College, Mr. Eric Graham, President of the Graham Group. Sorry, one second. Uh, Leanne uh, Brewer, uh, Director of Millsaps College's Executive and Continuing Education. Uh, Dr. Grubbs uh, earned his BS in Psychology from Millsaps College, his MBA from Mississippi College, and his PhD from the University of Mississippi. He became a full faculty member of the L School of Management in January of 1987. He has spent most of his adult life as a member of this community, and he has said that it's given him firsthand knowledge of the value of being associated with a college such as Millsaps. Sorry, I'm trying to invite people simultaneously. Um, Dr. Groves has worked in the banking industry either as an employee consultant or board member since he was 17 years old. He continues to consult in the banking industry and serves on the board of First Commercial Bank in Jackson and chairs the bank's risk management committee. In addition, he serves as a member of the bank's asset liability management committee and the trust committee. He states that one of his most significant professional accomplishments was participating in the group that originated First Commercial Bank in October of 2000. In addition to his banking background, he has consulted with a wide range of private sector not-for-profit and government agents, organizations over the past 30 years. It's this experience that he brings to the classroom. He has found that a practitioner limits their perspective on a problem or issue at hand, and unfortunately does not have the sufficient broad or deep understanding of the theory that shapes their views. So this is what you will expect in his class, a blending of theory and practice. Eric Graham has made a career of strategy. He has led North American regulatory affairs for the Low Earth Orbit Satellite Company, OneWeb, as well as strategy and corporate development for Ceasefire. Today, he is founder and principal of the Graham Group, which provides strategic consulting services to business and nonprofits. He is also a principal of LMI Advisors, where he provides regulatory consulting services to satellite companies around the world. Eric is a Mississippi native and received both a BA and MPPA from Mississippi State University, a JD from Mississippi College School of Law, and an MBA from the L School of Management at Millsaps College. Ms. Leanne Brewer, she earned her BA in English from Millsaps College in 1988. Sorry, Leanne, I didn't need to really date you, but I dated all of you, so it's all equal opportunity there. <laughs> um, she then spent the first 23 years of career in television and ad sales management, advancing to president of Lovecom. When Lovecom was purchased by Comcast, uh, Comcast Spotlight in 2006, she continued her leadership role as GM for Mississippi and Louisiana for the next four years. After serving in the nonprofit sector for a few years, she then started at Millsaps College in 2017 as the director of ed executive education, and it has now grown to include continuing education. Leanne is a connector of people and is committed to collaborate with key stakeholders in Mississippi to develop non-degree professional development and leadership training to Mississippi's businesses and nonprofit or, uh, communities. She's an active community volunteer and was recognized in 2006 by the Mississippi Business Journal as one of the 50 leading businesswomen of Mississippi. So thank you all for coming. I really do appreciate your time. And I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Grubb. Good. Thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. Nice to have everybody with us tonight. Thank you for joining. Just a couple of brief introductory uh, comments. Uh, early in my career at Millsaps, and I, I see that our Dean, Dr. Burke, is online. And uh, Kim, I think that was in the mid 18th century, if uh, I've got that <laughs> correct. It seems like it some days. I attended a workshop 
on campus led by John Clemens. Uh, John is, uh, was from Hartwick College and ran their Center for Humanities in Management. And that workshop introduced the ELTS uh, faculty uh, to the, the work that John was doing in uh, teaching leadership using classic literature and film. And I was hooked at that point. I started uh, researching that and uh, made the conclusion that this was uh, a really good way to teach leadership. Uh, I not only use classic literature and film, but I also blend in uh, some pretty heavy text uh, on, on theory. Uh, so you get that blending of theory and uh, uh, and literature and, and film as well. So what you're going to see today is about a 10 minute, a little over 10 minute, uh, very short clip from the film 12 o'clock high. It's not quite like seeing the entire film, which is what we do in class in my leadership classes, uh, because you can't put the in the uh, the clip that we're going to see in its full context in, in just looking at 10 minutes uh, of it. But this clip tonight is going to give us a common reference uh, when we subsequently discuss the leadership issues surrounding this interaction that you'll see among General Savage, General Pritchard, Colonel Davenport, and Lieutenant Zimmerman. And as Chris has mentioned, I hope you have gathered up your paper and your pencil or, or your iPad and can take some notes on what you're hearing in the dialogue, but also what you're seeing in terms of nonverbal behaviors. And we'll want you to uh, uh, discuss those with us as we, uh, as we go forward with this film. Uh, so I'm going to turn this over now to Leanne, who's going to tell you a little bit about the details uh, of the film, so you can get a, a pretty quick handle on the characters and the roles that they're playing. Leanne. Thank you, Ray. Um, you'll see that 12 O'Clock High is a 1949 classic war movie um, based on real people and real events. Uh, it's the story of the first B-17 bombers in England in World War II, and it's set in 1942. Um, the story focuses on the 918th bomb group that earned a reputation as a hard luck unit. You'll see four people in these scenes, Colonel Keith Davenport, uh, the group commander of the 918th, Brigadier General Frank Savage, who's played by Gregory Peck, and he's the aide to General Pritchard and the assistant chief of staff. Lieutenant General Pritchard, who's a two-star general, is commander of the 8th Bomber Command and affectionately referred to as the old man. Lieutenant Zimmerman, Zimmy, um, was the navigator of today's mission. In this scene, the 918th has just returned from a failed mission where they lost five of their 21 bombers. 50 crew members were lost. The 918th commander, Colonel Davenport, has just learned they've been assigned another mission the following day. It's a daylight bombing run at 9,000 feet versus 19,000 feet. Tomorrow's mission is 10,000 feet lower than where they flew today's disastrous and deadly mission. And I'll turn it over to Eric. Thanks, Diane. So before we talk about how we'll work through these scenes and some things to watch for, we'll give you one more reminder. If you don't already have a pen and paper, please get that now because we want this to be a discussion, not a lecture. And we want your participation as we go through these scenes when we take our pauses and then when we wrap it up. We'll watch about seven minutes of multiple scenes in this, the first view, and then we'll stop to discuss what we've seen at that point before we finish the last two minutes or so uh, of this series. The movie is 70 years old. Few, if any of you have seen this before. So most of this group is going to get this as a first impression. This will be the first time you get to think through these things and, and consider these leadership issues that are presented. It's in black and white. 
Uh, there are no special effects. There are no fancy camera angles. There, there are no distractions. You'll be able to focus on the four people who are speaking. And don't just focus on the ones who are speaking at the time, but also look at some of the nonverbal behaviors and see if that affects your view of some of these characters and where they are positioned in this situation. Also, think about ways that their dilemma is both similar to and different than what we face today in contemporary business or other organizations. We have a list of themes that will help you consider some of what you're about to see. You don't need to copy these down. These will be put into the chat window. If you haven't already opened that, please open the chat window. And they'll be available to you for reference as we go through this clip. But do take notes and consider some of these things that are themes of, the, of these scenes. One, what would you do if you were in the place of the three primary leaders here, Colonel Davenport, General Savage, or General Pritchard? Think about what it means to give maximum effort. How do you achieve it? How do you get it out of your people? What does that mean in, in contemporary organizations? <clears throat> How do you know when you're over-identifying with your team and losing sight of the big picture? Can allegiance to each other be misplaced if the unit doesn't reach its goal? Think about ways that you, or you have seen others, empower team members to achieve more. And what's effective to do that? At what point does empathy become sympathy? How do you overcome this idea of hard luck with leadership? And how can a sense of shared meaning and purpose help your team achieve its goals? Although we'll all get the same images in our minds as we watch this clip, you may think of other themes and have experiences that you wanna share. We know in a group like this, uh, you, you won't be able to share everything that comes to mind like you could in a class when you have the same group meeting over and over and you build a sense of, of camaraderie among each other and, and you know things will be confidential. But we do encourage you to take notes on things that uh, resonate with you and then please do join the discussion when we take those opportunities. So with that, I see that the themes have been added to the chat. We're going to begin the clip. We haven't been penetrating the concrete in those subpens, Keith. Now, we can't get concentration and accuracy from 19,000. We've got to go in once down low to see if we can get the job done in one trip instead of fighting our way to the target five times and back for nothing. Now let's allow from here in that when the old man cuts a field order, he's thought about it. There isn't time to take every one of them apart to see what makes it tick. If I were you when I got one, I'd just go ahead and fly. I was gonna bring these down to you tomorrow and to steal them from the rat. Hope they're the kind you want. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, man. I won't need him at 9,000. Be plenty hot. Well, I better get on back and get the chores done. I'll stay put in the night here. Thought I might run down tomorrow to see you. How many do you expect to put out? 18. Pretty bad luck today? Not good. We had one break through the runway of takeoff. It threw us late. We never made it up. It cost us plenty. I don't know how anybody out guesses that one. No. I'd like to help you locate where the trouble does lie, if I could. What about your formation? I can tell you where the real trouble is, Frank. It isn't formation. Shoot. It isn't down in the groups, either. It's up here, where a bunch of boys get to be nothing but a set of numbers. That's what's the trouble. Do they know up here what my boys have been taking for three days in a row? That they'll be up again all night to get 18 in the air for tomorrow? How much do you think they can take? Do you know they're falling asleep at briefing? Are you going to drive them till they crack? Take it easy, Keith. Take it easy. Bomber Command can take it easy. Those boys are flesh and blood. They'll die for you, but they've got to have a chance, and they know they haven't got one. Frank, they can have. They know a man's chances run out in 15 missions. Somebody's got to give them a limit, a goal, some hope of living. What do you guys think they're made of? Look, Keith. Yes, sir. I'll be there in a minute, sir. Go 
those things are coming, Keith. Replacements. Combat limits. But right now, the deal is to hang on. And look, Keith, you've got to find a way to save yourself a little. You can't carry all the load. It's too big. Don't worry about me. If you want something to worry about, worry about the crew. Better go on up and see him. Give him my love. If I do, he'll send you his. He rates you pretty high. Not according to Lord Hawha. Good night, man. Well, never mind what the reasons. There it is, Frank, and you can't make anything else out of it. Five missing today, and they'll only put up 18 tomorrow. It's getting worse instead of better. Yes, sir. He's been talking to Keith. He's low enough about it. What really happened today, did he tell you? Dig into it. Get tomorrow ahead of me. What do you make of it? Hard work, I guess. There's always some outfit picks up the jinx. You don't believe that. Fill yourself a drink. Thanks. I scare off that bug of yours. I don't believe in hard luck. There's always a reason. What have you got on your mind, Frank? Spill it. I'd rather not. Let's have it with the bark on. Well, you won't like it, I don't. It's the group commander. He? Well, it's always the group commander. It's his job, isn't it? A little funny coming from you. He's your friend. I didn't ask you to ask him. I didn't mean it to sound like that, Frank. It's okay. I don't believe it, though. I don't think I do. <clears throat> On paper, Keith looked to me like the best group commander we've had. He's blown every mission, gets more loyalty out of his men than anybody. Hurried, he works hard. I don't know where to fall. A man like that can't cut it, we're in trouble. What happened downstairs to change the picture for you? Nothing. Added this to it, though. He's going to bust wide open. He's going to do it to himself, too. Why? Because he's a first-rate guy. Because those are his boys, and he's thinking about them instead of missions. Over-identification with his men. I think that's what they call it. You aren't going to change it, either. I can't buy it, Frank. Not yet, anyway. He's still here? No, we have tomorrow to get ready for him. I'll give you that much. We'd better find out. If it's true, we're in trouble. Why should the other groups hold together if the 918th can't? Call my car, will you, Frank, while I get my pants on? You mean you want me to go down there with you? You bet I do. It's your idea. We were three minutes late over the target. Got most of it here on our bombing run. That was a deadly three minutes, Keith. The whole idea was to get all the groups over the target simultaneously and at different altitudes so that enemy flak couldn't concentrate on any one group. We sure were sitting ducks out there alone. Maybe I shouldn't have tried the target. But we were there, and I figured the boys wouldn't want to bring their loads back home. No man makes a perfect plan, Keith. You couldn't foresee a plane breaking through the runway. Maybe the mistake lay in not going on to the secondary target once you were late. But I figured we'd make up the time, catch up with the other groups. Could have, too, if it hadn't been for our stick and luck. Luck? What luck was that? It wasn't luck, sir. It was my fault. It wasn't anybody's fault. I'd like to hear the lieutenant's version. Yes, sir. We had to alter the navigation and flight, sir, to cross the enemy coast here. We picked up an error, the wind change. And I missed a checkpoint here, San Lo. By the time I caught it here at Wren, it cost us three minutes. We never made it up. If there's any fault, it's mine, sir. I was in command. I ordered the change in flight. 
Weather was thick enough. It could have happened to anyone. Well, I think that covers it. Thank you, Lieutenant. Thank you, gentlemen. Jimmy. Yes, sir. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Okay, we're going to pause here for just a minute and start our discussion. Um, so what would you have done? If you were Colonel Davenport, what would you have done? I like to call these type of situations that uh, Davenport and Savage and Pritchard find themselves in now is a leadership moment. And I'll bet you have some of them too, where you have to make a decision. You've got to do something here. You've got to go one way or the other. Each have consequences. The total effect of your decision may not be known for quite some time, but nevertheless, you have to make a call and make a decision. So, can we get some ideas? Uh, what would you have done if you were Colonel Davenport at this point in time, at this leadership moment? Is it free range to talk? Yeah. Excellent. Um, I don't know. I think it's easy for us to be Monday morning quarterbacks, too. I realize, like, sometimes when you're in the in the heat of it, it's, uh, you know, you make a decision that you think is right. But um, I think when I was listening to the dialogue between Keith, um, you know, and he was trying to take responsibility for the navigators, um, which I, was that Zimmy, Zimmerman, Zimmy? Zimmerman? Yeah, trying to take responsibility for his mistake and the navigator saying, hey, you know, I made this error. And as the leader, you know, I think, Davenport would have been better served to let the navigator own his mistake and then pivot versus, you know, continuing going right ahead, you know, full steam ahead, maybe a little bit pompous, you know, thinking they could make things up, especially when people's lives were at stake. Um, but, you know, the, and then the part of when Davenport says to Zimmy, like, hey, don't worry about it. I I think you got to let when people make mistakes, you you can't cover it up and be soft. I mean, not that you have to hang them out to dry or run them through a buzz saw, but, you know, we learn from our mistakes. And it, I think he cheated him of a learning opportunity if he doesn't allow him to totally own it and, um, you know, and learn from it and get better uh, or else, you know, like, I don't know how you get better uh, if if someone takes away that opportunity from you. Yeah. I'll be quiet now. No, thank you, Mark. Other ideas? Yeah, I'll cheat a little bit. I've seen this how many times? Um, Martin made a, a good comment there about Davenport is playing the role of a leader, taking the blame. Ultimately, the buck stops with him on that mission. Uh, even though the navigator made the mistake. Did anybody pick up on Davenport and his decision to go to the primary target after falling behind versus going to the secondary target? Yeah, I picked up on that. And it just seems like um, there were... You know, there, there, there was an intention, and then there was uh, an intention, a plan, a strategy, and then there was what really happened in the field. And rather than adjusting to what happened in the field, they were trying to tick the boxes on the uh, on the checklist. Yeah, excellent point. Uh, who was it? I think Mike Tyson. It said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Um, until Mike Tyson punches them in the mouth. Just <laughs> got to give him that credit. 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's an excellent point that uh, rather than going to plan B, it was tick off the boxes. Uh, and what do we think? Do people, without getting into too many details, is that something people experience in their organizations today, not just 70 years ago, but here in 2020, 2021? Maybe even when you're confronted by a global pandemic, uh, do we see leaders ticking off the boxes instead of pivoting? Absolutely. So in the chat, um, Albert uh, suggests, um, Daniel says, ask the guy, what can you learn from, from it? And he also says, what is the real problem here? What was the flight of failure and how do you measure that? Good question. Anybody have any thoughts on those questions? Did they miss both targets or? So it helps to have more of the movie, but it was an either or proposition. Either you go with the other three groups, all four groups to target one, or if something happens, you go to your secondary target. Uh, and because they're 21, planes out of the 918th were late, the anti-aircraft guns had the right altitude dialed in and had all of their focus on a single group, which is how they lost five planes and, and 50 crew members on that mission. Right. And I mean, to, and to, I don't see how we can look at this without going outside of the scope of the story or or the information we've been given. Um, that's uh, you know that's a that's a temptation of uh, of analysis. Um, it's you know we can we can guess we can we can speculate we can ask why but we don't know why. Um, and we don't know why they didn't do why why they didn't uh, either have or implement a backup plan if they had one. Yeah, that's a good point. What about the hard luck aspect of this? Any thoughts on? Does that give us a little more uh, color on on this group on the leadership style maybe? Did you say hard luck? I miss. I'm, I'm... Yeah, yeah. They've got this reputation as the hard luck group. They talk about hard luck a couple of times. Um, does that tell us anything about the group? Does it tell us anything about Davenport? I'll let others talk before I jump in. <laughs> I don't. I don't think there's any luck in being prepared. Um, <laughs> if if you're prepared, you don't need luck. You'll be you'll be prepared to to do what you're supposed to do. I would agree with sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I was gonna say I, I would agree with that that the, the lack of preparation and there's a bit of a significant bit of overconfidence um there with Zimmy and Davenport, the idea that we knew we were behind, but we just thought we could make it up rather than being prepared to go ahead and go to the secondary target when they know they've missed the first. Was that Zimmy's call, though? Well, it sounded like that he got directed that that the that Davenport right uh, told them to keep going. Or I mean, he maybe that's where he could uh, claim some responsibility for uh, not uh, adjusting, helping them make the adjustment. I think that's why he claimed all the all of the responsibility because of his bad decision making skills. What was was he in the air with them or was he calling shots from the ground? Did they have a did they have a a, a lead uh did they have a point guy in the air? Was he, like, yeah. Turn that off. Excellent question. Um and it, it it comes out in the uh, scene slightly before we, we were able to start just because of time. 
So um, Davenport was actually flying the plane as the group leader. Zimmerman is the navigator, and the rest of the group is doing what he does as the lead for the group. So Davenport has the flight controls in his hands, and you'll see that in this next scene when they discuss it. Zimmerman is is his navigator. Okay. Can I uh, can I ask if there it was an opportunity to delegate this into smaller batches, split the the large group into smaller groups until they they fly in towards their specific kill zone, so that they look more like reconnaissance uh, planes. Uh, spread it out until you're ready for the actual surprise. Yeah, great thought there. Um, and this starts to get it pretty detailed, and this is not in the movie, but at this point in the war, the groups were flying in 21 plane formations, and because uh, German fighting fighters would take to the air, they would stay in a group of 21 in a certain formation so that the guns from the bombers could protect each other. The, the tighter group they had, the better protected they were. Um, but yeah, a very good thought there. Is there a way to approach the target um, separately and then converge it at a single point before the bombing run? Having seen the whole movie many times, uh, I think that what you're presented with here is a general and Gregory Peck character, I can't remember his name, who formulates an idea about what the problem is. It's Davenport is the problem. He's tried to convince the senior general, and the senior general is going to turn around and say, you see the problem, you fix it. If I, if I may talk about this concept of the of the hard luck, um, I think you've got to to feel out with your with your crew. Is this something coming from them? If it is, then you've got to hear why they're thinking they've got hard luck, and address what they can do to take control of that situation, so that they have the confidence to move forward. If they're unconfident, if they feel like they they've already lost, they need to be able to. To have the assurity to not to make the right decisions so that they're not hesitating and automatically failing. You've got to feel out what they're, they're what they're putting out there, and is this stuff that's coming in on them? If it's from outside, then you can you can build them up from the inside, uh, saying you know that's that's theirs. We're going to show them. If it's from the inside, you've got to convince them that we have the capacity we've been we've just been careless or or we've been missing the point yeah that that's a that's a solid point um do they do they have a bad attitude about themselves and does it show uh you know i don't i hesitate to call it a self esteem or group esteem but it's are they <clears throat> Um, you know, are, 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 are they bringing, are each of them bringing something that, that, uh, you know, that creates this, uh, cause I mean, they could be technically competent. They could each know their jobs. Um, uh, it's. They could, in theory, know how all the parts are supposed to move together, but um, is it is is the hard luck thing? You know, was it was it always there, and then somebody gave it a name, and that made it worse? Eric, I've got a question I'd like to add to this, um, and I got it from uh, somebody who pose this in uh, in the chat. How how does Davenport, Colonel Davenport, how do you think he measures success in uh, the 918th bomb group? I think he'd mentioned the um the number of successful missions that they had accomplished. Okay.
I think he measures failure by how many planes he has lost. And that's uh, critical because he's focusing more on the failure than he is on the success. Hmm. It does yes, sound like they're, they're all caught up more in their um, their perceptions and their people than they are in the logistics of what the, their resources are. You don't hear him going, I won't have men to keep doing these missions. You hear him going, my men can't keep going. They're, they're, they're falling out. And it's, uh, you know, that has to be addressed from a integrity, not a logistics standpoint. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, sorry. Go on. No, no, I, I, I um, think that's a, a very good response to this. I think he may have some metrics uh, that he's following that uh, maybe General Pritchard and General Savage have some different metrics, perhaps. I, th I think one of the things that we kind of learned as a culture from World War II can be that uh, during these times, it we do have to make individual sacrifices for the, the safety of the nation and the country. And here he's gotten so caught up in the safety of these men that he's lost the, the, the perspective that if we don't win this war, those men are as good as dead as well as everyone they love and care about back home. Yeah. Very good point. So if you were Davenport in this situation, would you fire Zimmerman? Of course not. I might have him retrain. Who would we replace him with? There's a question of what are your resources? Do you have somebody that can do this job better or not? Um, and military protocols uh, are gonna be influencing what decisions are available to you. Um, I, I don't know that he is necessarily someone who is locked in so much as he is somebody who's more like chasing his own tail. He, he's, uh, not to get too graphic, but I, I kind of think of getting your head up your backside as being when all you can see is your own crap. And, uh, that's kind of where he is. If he can get out of that situation where he's just seeing the stuff that's going on around, around his, his small group, I think. I think the character seems like he has the potential to be good at getting back to what he's been trained for and what they need on this mission. But it's about getting him to step back and to see the big picture importance of, of yes, these men are, are tired and they, that needs to be addressed, but we've, we've, we can't have a, a, an emotional fear because you're gonna communicate that to your men. And you can't have that fear and that hesitation because that's the difference between pulling the trigger and getting the trigger pulled on you. So if you were able to replace Zimmerman, say you could replace him with another navigator and you're Davenport, <clears throat> do you do that or do you not? Well, I have the potential to, and I have the confidence that the new person is going to do the job that needs doing and I'm not just ignoring his issues that, that, that he's bringing up to me as Davenport, then yeah, I, I, I certainly consider replacing him because this is, this, this is not for me the same as being in a business relationship. This is life and death for everybody involved. And so you, you don't have that, that time to hesitate on somebody to get them up to full capacity. But it seems to me that the guy has the capacity to be great with his men if he can get his uh, stuff in order, if he can't do it in the short term, then lives are on the line. If I have somebody that can come from the back bench and, and step forward, I'm okay with it as long as I'm not uh, violating uh, military regulations or, or any kind of that, because you can't break the rules in the military or else the the confidence of the men, sorry. <laughs> kind of. In the, the context of this uh, short clip, what are the consequences to Davenport and the 918th if he does not fire Zimmerman? Consequences, I think, are that uh, Davenport takes responsibility for his command. And that's what he's supposed to do. 
if his man is not trained properly, that's his problem, not the man's problem. Really good discussion, folks. Well, I mean, I, th I, I think it's, it's, it's both their problems. Is there a thing of, uh, with Davenport, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm Davenport and, and, and everybody should know. And, uh, you know, there's not, there's not a clear line of communication details are not being conveyed. And on the flip side, um, are the, are the men thinking more like, I'm, I mean, I, you know, I'm in this group. I should, uh, you know, I should, uh, I should, I, I should know, uh, um, I should, uh, you know, I, I don't want to look silly at asking follow-up questions. Or even the tail gunner that gets on the plane with Zimmerman next time. Do, do I have confidence that Zimmerman's going to guide us or am I coming home? And, yeah. and that's another thing. Do they, do they, do they have confidence in each other? Not just from, uh, you know, from a, from a leader subordinate standpoint, but, uh, um uh do they trust each other to make sure everybody get to, to to where they know everybody's gonna do what they need to do so that everybody makes it home eric uh i've got about 650 and uh i hate to move this along right now i'm afraid we have to I think we should, and I think we should see the uh, the concluding short scene, uh, and then come back to this and and uh, talk about it some more. Yeah, I agree. Um, and so, as we make the switch here, if you would please write down, if you were Davenport, what would you do, if anything, with Zimmerman, uh, and then also put yourself in the place of Savage and or Pritchard, and. Think through what you would do in, in that role about the situation of a failed mission due to uh, the the mistakes of one man that lost ultimately ended up losing five bombers and fifty crew members or or two men depending on how you see this. And as you do that, we'll roll back over to the video to give you just another second or two to get your thoughts together. And then we'll see how Davenport, Savage, and Pritchard decided to resolve this. Keith, I know you're tired, but let's talk a little. Sit down. Let's talk about luck. A pretty critical three minutes, Keith. Five crews, 50 men. You think I don't know? I know you do. Whose fault was it, Keith? I told you, sir, primarily it was mine. Were I... you flying? Yes, sir. Do you fly and navigate too, or do you rely on your navigator? You have to rely on your navigator, but after all... Then it was the lieutenant's fault. He missed the checkpoint, but it could have happened to anyone. I know, and I allow he feels as rotten about it as any of us do. More so, maybe. But what happens now, Keith? I don't understand you, sir. We're talking about luck. I don't believe in it. I believe that to some degree a man makes his own luck. Yours has been pretty bad down here, and it's getting worse, not better. Maybe the navigator's in point. He blew it. What are you going to do about it? General, I don't believe in chopping off heads because of one mistake. I... Well, I just don't think that's any way to run a group. I feel sorry for the boy, Keith. But what are the men in your group going to be thinking about the next mission he navigates? That he messed up the San Nazar mission. It's just that much more load on them. And one day if they fall apart on you, that won't be luck. There isn't a man in the outfit who wouldn't stake his life on Zimmy. General, if it was anyone else but him, he's got two strikes against him to begin with. You don't realize, sir, that boy's got a persecution complex. He wants to fly every mission trying to live down the fact that his parents were mixed up in the German-American Bund. He screened Zimmy plenty before he ever got overseas. That's what's riding him now. Keith. Good navigators is the one thing we're not sure of. If you decide that you ought to relieve this boy, I'll give you a good replacement. You might as well ask me to stand him up against the wall and shoot him in the back. 
No, I won't do it, sir. I just can't do it to him. I won't. Keith, I want you to get to bed. Have the flight surgeon give you a shot that'll make you sleep 24 hours. I guess a man only has so much to give, and I guess you've given it. Effective now, you are relieved of this command, and you will report to me for duty at Bomber Command. I'll send someone down to take over here. Good night, Keith. Good night, sir. So there's our answer, or at least that's Pritchard's answer. Now did Pritchard do the correct thing? I think like, um, the guy said he had two strikes against him already, so uh, I'm not sure if that was. Uh, you know, actual strikes or whether it was conjecture, but um, if he had two strikes against him and he made this mistake, then he, he dang sure should be gone. Yeah, there's a, uh, I don't know, there, there's, there, there's almost a lack of uh, professional objectivity. They're, uh, you know, they're they're, they're, for for lack of a better term, they're too much. They're, they're they've they've got too much emotional investment. That's a, that that's yeah. I think the general is much more calculated to you know measuring risk versus um, the you know the, the the pilot is measuring these things with the the emotion of uncertainty, which really can't be uncertainty can't be measured the same way that risk can and i think that's what the general is all about here well if, if uncertainty could be measured it wouldn't be uncertainty now would it <laughs> <laughs> welcome to chaos theory <laughs> well that's war yeah yeah couldn't couldn't Pritchard have just instructed uh, Davenport to relieve Zimmerman from the job? Why did it have to result in uh, Davenport losing his command as well? I think because Davenport wasn't re ready to pull the trigger, and he 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 gave him the opportunity to make that change, but he was not making it. And time is an issue; lives are lost every minute and more. It also seemed very clear that Davenport was overly invested in that in Zimmerman's uh, feelings and uh, esteem, and um, and the general was a little bit more objective. And he, it was Davenport's to make the call to deal with his subordinate, and since he wouldn't. Or was unwilling that um, the general uh, kind of kill kill two birds there because both of them needed some adjustment in their uh, for the good of the group. It seemed. Yeah. Well, 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 let's you know let's let's take this out of a military situation. Uh, and, uh, you know, and extrapolated back into one of our situations. I mean, the whole point of the military is to kill people and break things. And, uh, you know, they weren't, uh, they weren't appropriately invested, prepared, whatever to do that. We don't kill people and break things in our business, but it's, uh, you, you know, how do we, uh, you know, how, how, how but emotional compromise it, it being becoming emotionally compromised can happen. So, um, 
how do we, how, you know, how do we, how do we deal with that? How do we keep ourselves on the path? Well, I think we do have to break a few things. Right? I mean, you can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, right? I mean, what about this idea of creative destruction? Is what you know is what that all of innovation is the is the fruit of capitalism, right? I mean, there's, I think there is an element of destruction. Um, maybe that's a little bit aside from your question. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to put that out there too. But, but I, I, I think it's, you know, an important part of it. It's interesting. The uh, you can't make an omelet without breaking an egg is uh, um, contained in one of the other another of the uh, movies, All the King's Men, that I like to use in leadership class as well. It's the story of Huey P. Long. And some interesting uh, things there as well. But anyway, that struck me when you. Uh, mention that. Um, do you put any responsibility? What you know about Davenport now is is limited. It would still be limited to knowing fully, even if you had seen the entire two hour and fifteen minute movie. But you would know him a lot better. But what you know about him right now, do you think that in part his hesitancy to remove Zimmerman is one of the reasons the nine eighteen was known as the hard luck group. Yes. Yeah, if the guys, if Zimmerman has made three strikes, well now three strikes, he's already made two strikes before, and he's the lead navigator in the in the group, then yeah, that surely surely could contribute to the other other mistakes or other hard luck instances that they have had. I believe. How about Davenport's role in the 918th becoming the hard luck unit? Not just what his decisions are with uh, Zimmerman, but not having a plan for if a plane went through the runway or not making the decision to go to the secondary target. Do we give him any, any do we give him any of the blame for the hard luck of the 918th? Yeah, indecision is a decision. Uh... Uh, I mean, I, I know in, in the hardest lesson I've had to learn in business is uh, you know, terminating people. Is kind of easy. Um, and the only way that made it, it's never palatable, but the only way that made it somewhat palatable was thinking about the other however many hundreds of people that we have, you know, if somebody has employed, a number of people that have employed, that you are you have to consider the impacts of not terminating somebody that should be terminated and the, the repercussions of leaving that person on board. Um, those have lasting effects as well, because that may not not relieving them of their duty affects other things, um, other people's lives. So you have to you have to make that call sometimes, even as difficult as it is. I think, uh, Michael, with your, I totally am on board with what you were saying. And I think sometimes what makes it even harder is when you're emotionally or over, over identifying with your team and emotionally invested in someone. And you can't, it's hard to draw the line of, you know, that you're doing something to someone you care about versus doing something that's right for the business or, or right for, uh, you know, the group as a whole. And it's funny, there's, I guess, a couple of iterations of this and, you know, today there's a modern day genius philosopher by the name of Ted Lasso. Um, some of you guys may have seen the show and he has a similar dilemma with his captain. Uh, his captain's lost a step. He's aging, doesn't make decisions like he used to. His speed is gone and it, you know, not to spoil a show, but ends up costing them, you know, pretty dearly. But his indecision to bench, even though his other coaches were saying bench him, his indecision to do it cost, uh, had a pretty, pretty large cost to it. And, I think that's probably some of the things that I struggle with the most as a leader, you know, where I have to to separate the right thing to do versus, you know, how I feel about emotionally feel about a person. And that's that's tough for me to separate, um, you know, a lot of times. And it helps having a really good team who, you know, maybe other leaders who are a little more detached and can call you out on your like, hey, you're too, you know, you're being selfish about the decision. You're putting the the you know the emotional health and welfare of one person ahead of the entire team, and that's pretty selfish. And if you've got a good team that'll tell you those things, 
you know, that's a pretty effective group. Um, and I don't know, you know, I think that, uh, <clears throat> that Savage, uh, was, was trying to communicate that to, to Davenport, um, and Davenport just wasn't, I don't know that he was, and I don't know, maybe Savage, maybe I'm, and I may have missed, missed said that too. Maybe Savage, it should have been Savage that should have told him, Hey, you, you have making a huge mistake. You got to sack Zimmy or replace him or, or it's going to cost you gravely. Mark, if I could ask you to to think about this uh, with me for just a minute. So it's it's not a it's not a bad thing to show compassion for others at work, and it's not a bad thing for your organization to meet their goals and objectives. So how do you make that choice between two good things, Doctor Grubbs? Can I? This is Scott. Hey, Scott. Yeah. So we had that exact same experience here at, at Millsaps, and it was a hard decision to make. We were meeting goals, and you know we we were knocking stuff out of the park. But I think as Martin was saying, one bad seed in the group was spoiling everything in the basket. And and as the person in charge of that department, I can see it. And it's a seventeen year relationship. Had a very, very personal, you know, and you give him. I was at that second strike. And it literally took the third strike that just says, "Sorry, it, it's just your your time here is done because what you're doing here is detrimental to everything else that we're trying to do as an organization. And we're we're taking two steps forward, and and you're bringing us one step back." And it was a very public facing player, you know, position and it was hard, but I tell you, you know, from being there, the 1st, one's the hardest after there, it's really simple. You know, when you see it and you've got clear goals and objectives and it doesn't line up with what the department and the institution and the mission is, then you just got to pull the trigger. That's that's part of being a leader, isn't it? In those cases where. A team member is working against the group uh, or, or doing things detrimental to the group, whether that's intentional things they're doing or whether it's like Zimmerman. Um, Zimmerman probably is a good guy. I don't think any of these people we could say are, are bad people. Zimmerman's just not measuring up. And it's even harder uh, when you're close, you have a tight knit team and someone, despite their best efforts, is just not making the grade and not not delivering what needs to be done. But if you're the leader, if you're in that role, because you have hard decisions to make. Scott, this is Sarah. Um, could you just expand when you said the the ones after that are simple? I, I think I I don't think you quite meant it like that. I'm <laughs> I don't want to be no. Uh, yeah, but I, maybe I see you, you could clarify a little bit because I don't think it's ever simple, is it? It's just uh, it, maybe it's expand it's, on that because for me it's never simple. <laughs> um, well, the, the the getting I, I don't say firing someone is simple, but, but right. simple is effective. A leader is recognizing your point of going. I've let this go too long. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's you you know it. You know, as a leader, and if you've been there, if you're a manager, if you're a director, whatever your position is. You you have a goal, you have an objective. Your responsibility is to assume to to ensure that the, the team collectively is meeting those goals. And when you can obviously see that something or someone or whatever is impeding that, mm -hmm. but you do nothing, then you're you're complicit. And the simple part of that is going. This is on me. I see that this is going the wrong direction. I've got to step in and I need to stop it now and not let it continue to fester and to, to bubble up and have others, you know, the, the, the coffee talk and the water cooler talk going. This guy over here is just constantly not doing or not meeting his. I'm working all this time and this person's just got his feet propped up. That, that's kind of what I mean by simple. That It becomes simple to say, I know the right thing to do. I just didn't do it because I was afraid. Mm -hmm. And, and Thanks, so, 
Yeah, and that's what I meant by that. Yeah, and I'm sorry if it was a little lax with saying that, but just going. No, I, I figured you know I just wanted you to expand a little bit that uh, to help me because yeah. that's a situation I'm in. You know, in other circumstances, and you know, it always seems it's it's it always seems hard. It's even though it's it, the right thing to do becomes clear. It's so yeah, challenging. And, it's, it's it's devastating, but I'll tell you that you know after this situation, years passed, and I'm still in great contact with the, the you know the person we're talking about. And afterwards, it was you know we went to lunch one day, and it was the biggest hug I ever had, and said that was the biggest uh, eye opener that I needed, and that that set me on a completely different trajectory in my life. And hey, he's doing wonderful things now. Um, and that, that's a great example of something I've been wanting to add to this is that what we have here that they don't have in the situation with war is we have the opportunity to have a relationship with them after that decision is made where we can we can go, look, John, I saw what happened here. I saw what, what uh, Harry did, and I, I know that you need this to come back or to move forward or to do something different or do something similar, whatever it is, you have a you can have a human relationship with them outside of the the exact project that you're working on. And if they're unable to work with the project, that doesn't mean that they're, you know, not a human being to you anymore that, that, that has disappeared into the ether. They're a person you can deal with and can interact with and, and build them up in other ways just by being human. Well, to me, that's the most important thing. I mean, we're, we're here just to help help somebody advance to whatever that next stage is that they want to do. And we don't forget about them when they move on. We, you know, we, we keep in touch. And I, 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 for me, I'm in an IT industry. IT in Mississippi is really a small place. You know, we, we call it that seven degrees of separation, the Kevin Bacon thing. You don't go very far without finding somebody who has worked together in some IT organization. So we all stay in touch. And that's what, you know, told him, I said, we're not going to not be friends after this. It's just the way it has to be. And, and, and it was like, I understand, you know, you did what you had to do. And I made a mistake and I have to live up to it. And that was kind of the conversation. That was how it ended. One of the things I'd like to, to add to this, because Chris, I know we're, we're getting short on time. Uh, is is not only can we learn about leadership from looking at classic literature and film like like this, but we also learn as much from each other having this kind of dialogue uh, and make those make those uh, more uh, close uh, links to type situations that you and I face uh, instead of a, a war movie. Uh, so, thank thanks everybody for. We're doing this, but uh, this is the kind of thing you can expect in class. And, and to Dr. Grubb's point, I would say if you have not taken a look at the chat, um, please yeah. take a look at the chat before we wrap up because there have been some excellent points that rolled in as the discussion was going on. Uh, and just from being here tonight, you can probably gain something from some of the chat comments that people have submitted. Definitely. Thank you all so much and thank you for everyone's engagement. I really do appreciate it and I hope everyone if you had that opportunity to share and talk. Um, I know that it's challenging with the chat and then talking, but um, hopefully it was uh, engaging and it was um, informative for you. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is, is does anybody have any questions about the session this evening? Um. No, not really. I just, I just have to say this, you know, this was, this was huge. It's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a guy with, among other things, a film background, uh, uh, you know, plugging film, film, and film history into in the real world stuff is, is something that's always been an interest of mine. So, uh, uh, this was, this was done very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grubb. Does anybody know too? Is the movie like on Netflix? It's on Amazon. I can go look it up. I was just, I was just, I was wondering if anybody knew before I went and looked it up. Where? So I mean, thank you for that. Thank you. It's on Amazon.
Amazon Prime. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. For that. For that matter, whatever happened to Turner Classic Movies? I don't think we can get that in this market anymore, can we? Does any is anybody else a TCM fan? Oh, you can you yeah. can get it, but you have to get the package that has like fourteen sports channels you will never watch. Right, because I have so much in common with well, although I do I do like Premier League, so <laughs> I think you can get it on Hulu though. Yeah, I think okay. that's where my my son showed me how to do it. So. All right, good work, good work around. <laughs> well, if there's not any other questions, um, I want to thank everyone for coming. I want to thank Dr. Grubbs, Eric Bramley for for your time tonight and. I also want to share with everyone, we do have some other upcoming webinars coming that are part of the five essential skills to be an effective executive series. The next one actually is going to be Amazon. How do they know what you need before you do? I know we've talked about something and the next thing you know, it pops up as an ad on your Facebook. So um, Dr. Uh, Damon Campbell and Mr. Ted Hardy are gonna share more details about um, using uh, market backs, basket analysis and how correlation analysis, how those things can be used to predict what you need. And then also how you can apply those tools in your decision making. So that one is gonna be on Tuesday, April 6th. And then the one after that is five elements that make a brand a brand. So if anybody's looking to market yourself or market your company, that was going to be a great one to also attend. Also, for those of you that have interest of uh, learning more about our executive MBA program, we're hosting an information session on Tuesday, March 23rd at 6 p.m. This is a great opportunity to learn about the curriculum, learn about the program. We're going to have some of our alumni and current students also on the call, as well as the program director. Um, we're also going to talk about Merida, Mexico, and you're probably like, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, Merida, Mexico is actually part of the program. It is our study abroad piece, and you will actually travel to Merida, Mexico to do a large project. So um, if you have interest, I, I, I encourage you to attend. I'm sure you will receive an email about it, and if you don't, feel free to email me at mbamacc at millsaps.edu. Um, but other, 